Хорошо. За счет внимания получен приказ по той совместном действии. Фиксирую время при получении приказа. Есть приготовиться. По той совместном действии. Есть приготовиться. Второе готов. внимание. Есть внимание. Передача. Есть передача. Есть донесение. Просить донесение пусковых установок. Есть, опрашиваю. Все пусковые готовы. Заклад принято. Есть внимание. Пуск. Есть пуск. Hello and welcome to the Terran Space Academy, where we help prepare you for a bright future in the space industry. Please don't forget to like and subscribe, and help us out on Patreon if you can. We appreciate your support and feedback. There's been a lot of panic in the media lately about the possibility of Russia using nuclear weapons. Nuclear weapons have only been used twice in war. The first one, called Little Boy, was only the second nuclear explosion on Earth, after the first bomb was tested at the Trinity site in New Mexico. Little Boy was three meters long and had a mass of 4,400 kilograms. It was a uranium-fueled simple critical mass bomb. This is where a uranium bullet, enriched to an average of about 80% uranium-235, is fired into a larger piece of uranium. The combined mass was about 64 kilograms total, and this is enough to reach critical mass, converting less than one kilogram, or about 1.6% of that mass, into energy in accordance with Einstein's equation. This bomb was dropped on Hiroshima by a B-29 superfortress named the Enola Gay on the 6th of August, 1945, producing the same blast effect as 15 to 20,000 tons of TNT. The bomb exploded at an altitude of about 600 meters, or 2,000 feet, generating a 370-meter fireball with a temperature equal to the surface of the sun about 6,000 Celsius. The x-rays generated from the blast created superheated air and caused a supersonic shock wave that expanded out from the blast point. Everything within 1.6 kilometers of ground zero was destroyed, except for a few reinforced structures right under the bomb. An incredible heat pulse expanded out, setting everything on fire within this red area. 66,000 human beings were killed immediately. About 20,000 of those were Japanese soldiers, and the other 46,000 were civilians. Another 69,000 civilians were injured. A few days later, a second bomb, plutonium-based this time, was dropped, and here is what Nagasaki looked like after. This bomb was actually dropped over hills near the city center. It had more power than Little Boy and was named Fat Man. Fat Man was a plutonium bomb. It had a core of plutonium, seen here, an element not normally found on Earth, but made in nuclear reactors. The plutonium was compressed on all sides by a conventional explosion, increasing its density and reaching critical mass. It was dropped on the 9th of August, 1945, and exploded at about 500 meters above the ground, producing a fireball 3.2 kilometers in diameter. Around 40,000 people were killed immediately, and another 40,000 died later from the radiation. Destroyed in the blast was the munitions factory that made the torpedoes used against Pearl Harbor. These are the only two atomic bombs ever used in war. Nuclear bombs can be much more powerful today. The Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombs would now be considered tactical nuclear weapons, about the size of what Russia is threatening to use in Ukraine. Nuclear war is a terrifying concept that any sane person would fear. But courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is doing the right thing despite your fear. And it is important to keep things in perspective. About six months before the atomic attacks on Japan, Tokyo was firebombed by the Americans. 
279 conventional bombs fell on the citizens of Tokyo on the 9th and 10th of March 1945, killing over 100,000 Japanese civilians and leaving another 1 million homeless. Modern atomic bombs are called thermonuclear. This means that they have a fission primary stage, think of this as an igniter, and a fusion secondary stage with a plutonium spark plug. This shell is a high explosive lens, surrounding a shell of beryllium. Beryllium can reflect and focus neutrons. The high explosives compress this shell from all sides, crushing it and accelerating the shell of uranium-238, called a tamper, through this evacuated space, causing it to impact this metal sphere of uranium or plutonium that is holding tritium gas. We remember that tritium is a prime fusion fuel and is an isotope of hydrogen with two neutrons, but it only has a half-life of 12.3 years. The tritium must be replaced every few years or a bomb loses most of its power. This space is filled with polystyrene foam, which acts as a radiation channel. This container is a uranium pusher or tamper and surrounds the lithium-6 deuterium core. Anyone who has listened to our lectures on fusion energy will recognize this as fusion fuel also. The lithium-deuterium core surrounds this plutonium spark plug. The case is designed to reflect and focus the X-rays and is called a radiation case. The primary stage is detonated first. The high explosive crushes this sphere, impacting and compressing the plutonium around the tritium core. Temperatures reach 100 million Kelvin. Everything with a temperature above absolute zero gives off photons, going from invisible infrared to visible light, ultraviolet, and beyond. When something is 100 million Kelvin, the photons are mainly X-rays. These X-rays flood this space, called the radiation channel. The distance between the primary and secondary stages prevent this explosion from immediately damaging this part. The X-ray energy impacts the secondary stage. This energy implodes the tamper, which compresses this plutonium, increasing its density, so it reaches critical mass, creating a second fission explosion. This explosion heats the surrounding fusion fuel to around 300 million Kelvin. This energy is high enough to fuse some of the lithium and deuterium. The neutrons from this plutonium spark plug turn some of the deuterium to tritium, which is also fusion fuel. This massive tamper holds everything together long enough for fusion to occur. It absorbs neutrons and undergoes fission itself. This fast neutron reaction is the dominant contributor to a modern thermonuclear bomb which is essentially a small star created by humans. This is a two-stage teller Ulam design, fission, fusion, fission weapon. Almost all modern thermonuclear bombs are of this type. A bomb like this can create a detonation three to 500 times more powerful than the bomb that destroyed Hiroshima. The United States, Russia, China, Britain, France, India, Pakistan, and Israel all have these weapons. North Korea now also has fission weapons, and may have functional fusion bombs also. All but the smallest nuclear bombs are very heavy, and if they had to be carried by airplanes, they could all easily be intercepted by other airplanes. But airplanes are not the only way to deploy these. The first large rockets developed after World War II were made to carry these bombs. A rocket capable of flying from one continent to another is called an Intercontinental Ballistic Missile, or ICBM. Ballistic means the missile is thrown up in an arc and comes down at the end of that arc, like a ball thrown into the air. These bombs did not maneuver much in the early days. To be considered an ICBM, a missile must have a range of at least 5,000 kilometers. This takes a delta V of around 6,500 meters per second. Early versions of these were rapidly developed by both the United States and the Soviet Union after the defeat of Nazi Germany. The U.S. and USSR had worked together against the Germans, but both nations knew that after the war they would be bitter enemies. There was no way to reconcile Soviet communism, where the state owns everything and controls everything, with American capitalism, where the private ownership of property is enshrined in the Constitution. Early ICBMs were put in silos under the ground. This protected them somewhat from a preemptive strike. These missiles were one part of a nuclear triad, which included bomber-carried nuclear warheads and submarine-launched nuclear-armed rockets. When I joined the U.S. Air Force, 
American bombers continually circled the Soviet Union, 24 hours a day, waiting for the signal to go in and end the world as we know it. But bombers are big and can be shot down by fast jet interceptors or ground-based anti-aircraft missiles. But besides the bombers, we had the ICBMs. Once ICBMs are launched, it is almost impossible to intercept them all. It takes only about 28 minutes for an ICBM to leave a silo and strike the other side of the Earth. This is Mach 20 to 27. All early rocket systems, Titan, Redstone, and Atlas for the United States, R-7 and Proton for the USSR, started as ICBMs. After these ICBMs were developed for war carrying 1,000 kilogram warheads to the other side of the Earth, they were modified for peace. The R-7 was a Soviet ICBM modified with a second and third stage. Many ICBMs are two or three stage now, like the Minuteman missile ICBM, which is a solid rocket motor system. This has a civilian version called the Minotaur you can learn about in this lesson. Any rocket capable of generating this much velocity can be combined in stages to reach the 9,400 meters per second needed to get to orbit. The R-7 carried Gagarin to orbit first and the Redstone carried Alan Shepard to space soon after. These rocket systems have been modified over time to carry more than one warhead, and to have a final stage that would maneuver in space, allowing multiple bombs for different targets. These are called Multiple Independently Targetable Reentry Vehicles, or MERVs. These systems can have up to 12 warheads. The Minuteman II systems that I worked with had three warheads when I first went on alert duty. The Peacekeeper, or MX missile, deployed by the United States later, was 2.5 times the mass of a Minuteman missile. It could deliver 10 300 kiloton warheads to the other side of the Earth. The Soviet equivalent of the Peacekeeper was the SS-18, also called the RS-36 or the Satan missile. The Satan was 36.6 meters long and 3 meters in diameter, with a launch mass of about 191,000 kilograms. It could also carry up to 10 MIRVs to its target, and had a range of up to 16,000 kilometers. Then in 1991, everything changed. I was on duty with the Strategic Air Command, with command and control of Minuteman II ICBMs, when President Bush, this one, landed the SAC bombers, sending a clear message to the Soviet Union, then led by Mikhail Gorbachev, that it was time for both nations to step back from the Cold War. No matter what your political beliefs, President Bush doesn't get nearly enough credit for this gesture of peace. At that time, the United States nuclear arsenal was over 31,000 warheads and could have destroyed almost all life on the surface of the Earth many times over. The Soviet arsenal was even larger, with a peak of 45,000 warheads. After the START-1 treaty, the United States was limited to 8,556 nuclear warheads and the Soviets to 6,449. The United States deactivated 450 Minuteman II launch facilities and mothballed the 45 launch control centers that commanded them. When we first got the message through one of the secure communication systems, we all thought it was a communist plot. But the message authenticated, and we removed the enable devices on our missiles, turning these multi-billion dollar systems into very complex paperweights. But part of this treaty was an agreement to not develop anti-ballistic missiles. The Soviets already had some, but these were inaccurate nuclear bombs that they would detonate in space over their own country to try to wipe out incoming warheads. We knew this was a very inefficient system that would cause almost as much damage to their own country as to the incoming missiles, and that the supply of anti-missile systems would quickly be overwhelmed by wave after wave of nuclear warheads launched by the American Triad. There was no way the Soviet Union would survive a full nuclear exchange with the United States. But the opposite was also true. There was no way the United States could survive an all-out nuclear war with the Soviet Union. The U.S. and Soviet Union then signed an anti-ballistic missile treaty in 1972, agreeing not to start a new race to counter each other's missiles. The Strategic Defense Initiative, started by Ronald Reagan, threatened this agreement. But this system was impractical and never implemented. Besides ground-based missiles and bombers, Soviet and American nuclear ballistic missile submarines were on patrol 24 hours a day. Each of these can carry up to 20 submarine-launched ballistic missiles. 
the largest of these, were the Soviet Typhoon-class Akula submarines. Akula means shark, and these are still in service with the Russian Navy today. These systems combined ensured that neither side could use their nuclear arsenal, as we knew the other side could strike back. This was called Mutually Assured Destruction or MAD, which many people around the world thought it was but it reduced the chances of an American-Soviet Armageddon and made sure that if the United States were ever destroyed, its aggressor would suffer equal destruction in the hopes that the surviving democracies could maintain basic human freedoms. I am not a violent man by any means, but I was comfortable as a captain in the United States Space Command, being a part of that assurance. When the Cold War started, only the U.S. and USSR had nuclear weapons, but that quickly started to change. Smaller nations acquired nuclear weapons. Britain and France openly with the help of the Americans, China with the help of the Soviets, then India, Pakistan, Israel, and North Korea through third-party actors. The United States was fairly certain that almost all of these nations were more or less rational actors. India and Pakistan were at risk of attacking each other, but neither would dream of trying to strike the U.S. or its allies. Israel has not openly admitted to having nuclear weapons, but have made it clear that they would use them only for defense if they did have them. But North Korea was another matter. North Korea is a cult-led, ostensibly communist nation. But it is only communist in that the state owns everything, even the people. Communist doctrine does not allow emperors, and it definitely does not allow rule by descent, the passing of leadership from father to son. But this has happened through three generations in North Korea now. In a true democracy, former leaders step down and are replaced according to the will of the people. For any dictator, the surest way to die is to lose power, as maintaining power by force generates too many enemies. You must therefore be leader for life. In the late 90s, North Korea started working towards an atomic bomb. And the United States could not be sure that North Korea in its cultish fealty to a delusional leader, would not launch one, despite the certainty of complete destruction in an American counterattack. To defend itself, the United States began designing true anti-ballistic missiles. These missiles could be launched from ships or land and could impact and destroy an incoming ICBM. A nuclear warhead is a delicate device in some ways. If it is struck and damaged, it cannot create a thermonuclear reaction. North Korea withdrew from the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty in 2003 and detonated its first atomic bomb in 2006. It now has a suspected arsenal of around 30 to 40 nuclear weapons. These have a yield of up to 250 megatons, over 12 times more powerful than the Hiroshima bomb. These can be delivered by the Hwasong-15. This is a 72 metric ton, 22.5 meter long, 2.4 meter diameter rocket system that can carry one 1,000 kilogram warhead. It uses unsymmetric dimethylhydrazine fuel and nitrogen tetroxide oxidizer. It has a rocket engine based on the Soviet RD-250 and the engine produces 788 kilonewtons and can put the warhead on a ballistic trajectory to impact 13,000 kilometers from the launch site, reaching a maximum altitude of 4,500 kilometers, or possibly they could use the new Hwasong-17. Accurate facts are scarce on this ICBM. It is a two-stage system estimated to have a mass of up to 150 metric tons. It can carry one or more warheads with a mass of 2,000 to 3,500 tons combined and put them up to 15,000 kilometers from North Korea. If they can get it to work, so far it has failed in testing. To counter the North Korean threat, the United States has deployed anti-ballistic missiles. The first part of this defense system is 40 ground-based interceptors here at Fort Greeley, Alaska, and four more at Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. The 40 in Alaska have CE-1 exoatmospheric kinetic kill vehicles. I don't know what the ones in California have. New missiles may have a more advanced kill vehicle at some point, but there have been a lot of development problems with the upgrade. These missiles are considered mid-course defense missiles as they intercept the enemy ICBM in mid-flight high above the atmosphere. These systems are guided by radar and other sensors 
to impact the incoming missile as it's ascending, during its coast phase, or as it's arcing back down. These are designed to protect the United States from ICBM attack, but have a very limited capacity to accomplish this. To be reasonably safe, you would need to launch at least four interceptors at every ICBM. This means the U.S. could not counter more than 10 incoming missiles right now. But this system is not designed to counter an attack from Russia or even China. It is designed to stop the few missiles that a nation like North Korea could launch. The next phase in this defense network is the Aegis Ballistic Missile Defense System. These are on Aegis-equipped cruiser and destroyer warships. These use advanced radar with the SM-3 or SM-6 three-stage hit-to-kill missiles. These are designed to target short, medium, and intermediate range ballistic missiles, again in their mid-course phase, that might be launched against America's Navy battle groups or bases around the world. Guam and Okinawa would be prime targets. Japan has four Congo-class destroyers that have been upgraded with these American systems. Next, we come to the Terminal High Altitude Area Defense System, called THAAD. This is a single rocket booster with a separating kill vehicle. It uses radar and infrared to home in on an incoming threat. Each THAAD battery can carry up to 72 interceptors, eight per launcher with up to nine launch vehicles per battery. These intercept at the end of the mid-course stage and during the terminal stage. The impact can take place inside or outside the atmosphere. THAADs have been reported to work well during testing. And finally, we have the Patriot Advanced Capability System. Patriot missiles became famous during the first Gulf War shooting down incoming Iraqi Scud missiles. The Israelis went on to develop their Iron Dome missile defense system after seeing the effectiveness of the Patriots. These short-range missiles would be a last-ditch Hail Mary against an ICBM, but they work well against shorter-range missiles and are definitely effective against aircraft. Both China and Russia complained about the development of these systems, saying it was a violation of the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty. But in fact, none of these systems are a threat to either Russia or China's ability to attack the United States with a nuclear weapon. The development of these systems did, however, give Russia an excuse to upgrade its missile system. This is the Satan II, called the RS-28 or Samat by Russia, and SSX-29 or 30 by NATO. The Samat is a heavy-lift ICBM, capable of reaching a maximum velocity of Mach 20, and has a range of 18,000 kilometers. This makes it one of the longest range missiles in the world. The Sarmat is capable of carrying up to 15 warheads and can deploy avant-garde hypersonic glide vehicles that we'll cover in an upcoming lesson. This is the most powerful ICBM on the planet today. And Russia wants people to think that it makes a strategic difference and that the threat of Russia using nuclear weapons is as dire as the media is saying. A lot of people are very worried that if the world helps Ukraine, Russia will use these nuclear weapons. It is very important for everyone to understand that while tactical nuclear weapons use might not trigger a full strategic response, it would be absolute suicide for Russia to launch any nuclear weapon against the United States or any NATO ally. The United States has 400 Minuteman III missiles on alert today. These have a maximum velocity of Mach 23 and a range of 14,000 kilometers. An enemy nuclear launch can be detected in a matter of minutes by Earth-orbiting infrared satellite systems. And long before their bombs hit, ours would be in the air. But what if they used a nuclear submarine off the west coast of the United States? Since almost all of our ICBMs are in Montana and the Dakotas, and in a massive, very improbable first strike, took out our land-based missiles and airfields, while simultaneously hitting every NATO military base in Europe. Again, this would be suicide for them. Somewhere under the ocean right now are American, British, and French nuclear-powered and nuclear-armed submarines. Deep under the water, they would be immune to the electromagnetic pulses generated by the nuclear war raging above them. Everyone thinks that if we lost all of our satellites, we could no longer communicate with our military systems. This is not true. Here is a survivable low-frequency communication system. We always called it Slifkus. This is a 14 to 60 kilohertz system that has antennas buried deep in the Earth. These antennas can communicate with our other Slifkus systems through the Earth, in the oceans, and in the air. 
using the Strategic Automated Command and Control System. There are transmitters in the Post-Attack Command and Control System here, and in the Advanced Airborne Command Post, also called Nightwatch. Nightwatch would carry the President of the United States and their staff during a nuclear war. There is also one here, at Silver Creek, Nebraska, constantly sending out a signal saying that everything's okay. And another one here, at Hawes Air Force Station in California. These systems are all hardened against nuclear attack. If the entire United States and NATO were to be destroyed, in one fell swoop by some insane enemy, a signal identifying who was responsible would be sent out by these transmitters. That signal would be received by one of these. This is an Ohio-class American ballistic missile submarine. It is the largest submarine in the American arsenal and carries up to 24 Trident D-5 SLBMs, each with up to 12 W-76 475 kiloton warheads. Each of these missiles has a range of over 11,300 kilometers. That means that if any nation somehow managed to wipe out the entire United States and NATO, just one of these submarines would make 288 targets in enemy territory cease to exist, with each blast having a force almost 24 times that of the Hiroshima blast, and a total force of 136 megatons of power. Russia has nuclear weapons, that is true, and we should always take the threat of nuclear war very seriously. But no sane person could ever be so confident in their military prowess as to risk such a catastrophe for themselves and the world. Someday, perhaps all nuclear weapons might be under international control, as President John F. Kennedy wanted. Or a treaty might be signed that all the nations of the world would unite against any nation that first used a nuclear weapon. But in the meantime, let us do what is right, despite our fears, knowing that right now, around the world, Men and women on duty 24 hours a day. Make sure that we are secure. Thanks for listening and stay safe at Astra Proterra. Today, every inhabitant of this planet must contemplate the day when this planet may no longer be habitable. Every man, woman, and child lives under a nuclear sword of Damocles, hanging by the slenderest of threads, capable of being cut at any moment by accident or miscalculation or by madness. The weapons of war must be abolished before they abolish us.